Welcome to the unit Ancient Civilizations. This unit elaborates the history of ancient Western and Indian costumes. The unit analyzes a range of historical evidence and focuses on the evolution of clothing across various periods of time. This unit comprises of 10 modules. Each module has a final review section that invites you to reflect on what you've learned. By the end of this unit, students will be able to explain how costume develops differently within different cultural environments, identify costumes with reference to time periods and culture, create the realization that costume and fashion history lies in the excavated past of archaeology and art. Understand the reasons of costume evolution from necessity-driven basics to flamboyant styles. Explain the details of costume, its style and characteristics with relevant terms. Examine the range and diversity of costumes, coiffure and ornaments in various ages in a variety of styles based on classes and communities. The first module focuses on Mesopotamian costume and culture. Mesopotamian civilization existed between 3500 BCE and 300 BCE. The region centered between the Tigris and Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. The two rivers encouraged commercial contacts which developed into an international trading network. Originally, they had turned towards the rich cities of the Indus and the Persian Gulf and pre-Aryan civilization, which is confirmed by the Mohenjo-daro excavations. Later, following the two river courses, they had entered into contact with regions of the Caspian Sea, Cappadocia and Mediterranean coast, and traded with Syria, Armenia and even Egypt. This Mesopotamia was an ideal land for migration and led to successive repeated enrichment and plunders by nomadic tribes from surrounding areas. Though many different societies and organized city-states and empires emerged in Mesopotamia, historians study these cultures together because they lived near each other and had many similarities. The main civilizations were the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and the Persians. Sculptures of figurines, statues, wall decoration, relief work, uh, motifs found on pottery and other applied arts provide the largest source of information about the art, culture, and artistic style of Mesopotamian culture. The three great achievements of the Sumerians that provided for an entirely new order of human society were formalized religion, the body politic of the independent city-state, and writing. Sumerian religion was the first to be recorded. They believed that the world was flat and that it was surrounded by a huge hold space. They also believed that water was everywhere. They worshipped several gods, a practice called polytheism. The religious priest was seen as earthly representatives of God and therefore considered the most powerful people in Sumerian society. Later, the warrior kings would take that position. They built large pyramid-like structures called ziggurats to house their religious idols. Around 3500 BCE, the Sumerians developed a pictogram form of writing that was used primarily for record keeping, harvests, livestock, taxes, etc. Over a few hundred years, it evolved to a complex cuneiform of writing, included sentence stru structure and standardized grammar. With the development of large cities came a more complex economy and complex social structures life became more regulated in these city-states. Defense against invaders and natural calamities was shared and strengthened by their collective numbers and communal resolve. A standing army replaced tribal warriors. Labor became highly specialized and skilled craftsmen mass-produced the necessities for daily life such as pottery, basketry, woodwork, cloth and leather goods. A market economy developed. 
In early times, both sexes wore sheepskin skirts, with the skin turned inside and the wool combed into decorative tufts called konikes. These wraparound skirts were pinned in place and extended from the waist to the knees, or for more important persons, to the ankles. The upper part of the torso was bare or clothed by another sheepskin cloaking the shoulders. From about 2500 BC, a woven woolen and linen fabric replaced the sheepskin, but the tufted effect was retained, either by sewing tufts onto the garment or by weaving loops into the fabric. It later became style, stylized into borders of decorative fringe or tassels on a variety of garments. Long cloaks were worn and materials for garments and head coverings included felted wool and leather. Sumerians wore a variety of headgear and jewellery. Civilian hats were round domed styles with the brim turned up. They were made of materials like woven fabrics, moulded leather or felted wool. The caracul was tight with tiny curls that were styled into a pattern of holes all around the hat. Women are often depicted wearing elaborate coiffure and wigs rather than hat styles. Unmarried women wore a large rolled band with an open crown and hair open uh, over the shoulders. Married women wore various turban arrangements to demonstrate style and social standing while keeping the hair covered. The military uniform consisted of a wrap skirt, a leather helmet and a leather cloak which had copper or bronze disc affixed to them for added protection. They did not wear any footwear. Royalty had more elaborate version of dress and headgears. Women's headdress and jewellery including a comb, hair rings, hair ribbons and earrings found during the excavation of the tomb of what was probably a royal woman in Ur, Mesopotamia about 2800 BC. The ornaments were made of gold and gemstones, lapis lazuli and carnelian. Although the wrap garments of the Sumerians were simple in cut, the fabrics were dyed in vibrant colours and embellished with a great variety of embroidery, beadwork, fringes and tassels. In this picture, the seated man in the top row, left side, is wearing a conique skirt, while most other figures are dressed in fringe skirts. A few of the labourers in the lowest panel appear to be wearing loincloths or very short skirts. Here, the woman wears a close-fitting necklace of several strands and her wavy hair is visible around the edges of the head covering. The edges of the neck and drape covering the shoulders are ornamented with what appears to be a type of braid or embroidery. Let's now move on to the Babylonian and Assyrian civilization. After a series of successive invasions, the Babylonians emerged as the dominant victor. Art, culture and politics, though progressively developed, was still rooted in Sumerian tradition. Likewise, Babylonian costumes were based on Sumerian styles. A notable introduction was a cut and sewn short-sleeved tunic extending to the knees. Ankle-length versions were worn by men and women of high rank. These were functional and easy to construct. The Sumerian fringe decoration continued in this period. Greater skill in textile weaving was achieved as was ornamentation through embroidery. We now move on to the Assyrian civilization. The Assyrians were a warring kingdom intent on conquering land and extending their empire. They were renowned for their military prowess and glorification of war through their art. Assyrians continued the Babylonian tradition of costumes. Variations on styles were seen within the basic costume components of the tunic and layers of fringed shawls. The royal cloak was wrapped like a spiral several times around the body. The high priest's apron was a richly patterned garment tied around the waist with the opening at the front. 
it had a curved hem on one side and a straight hem on the other. The king's diadem was a truncated conical hat made of felt and decorated with gold bands. Assyrians used iron to replace bronze for production of weapons, shields, mail and helmets. A notable addition to the costume of Assyrian soldiers was footwear. Several varieties of shoes ranging from sandals to boots were designed for the military and royalty. Women did not enjoy the equal freedoms and rights like men throughout the Mesopotamian civilizations. They had strict costume regulations like requiring a veil in public. King Asur Nasirpal, 9th century BC, wearing a long tunic tied at his waist and covering the back half of his figure in a small richly decorated shawl about 20 inches square. He also wears the belt. The wavy tassels which look like horse hair hang from his sword belt. A tassel also hangs from the back of his necklace and two ribbons from his cap band. This is the tunic of King Asurbanipal, 7th century BC. The neck opening, which is a slit large enough to admit the head, does not show in the drawing. But three buttons on either side of neck will be seen. A row of fringe decorates the bottom and the whole is richly embroidered. Over this tunic were worn the wide and narrow belts. In this picture, the queen wears a similar tunic to the king, but the sleeves reach halfway down the lower arm. Her shawl, which is fringed all around, is wrapped once around the lower limbs and so covers the bottom of her tunic. It is then wound round the upper part of her body. This man in hunting dress, 9th century BC, has a small scarf fringed only at the ends, wrapped tightly around the limbs, reaching to the knee. The point to be noted in this figure is the arrangement of a fringe drapery which goes around uh, once the waist, is thrown over the shoulder and hangs down the back. Here the woman wears a long tunic and over it a long shawl fringed at the two ends. To drape this shawl, place one corner under the left armpit and draw it across the back under the right armpit, wrapping it once around the body. Draw it across the back and up over right shoulder. A corner of the fringed end will hang down in front of the right shoulder. In this picture, King Asur Nasirpal, 9th century BC, wears over his long tunic a very beautiful and dignified shawl drapery, which is fringed. We now move on to the Persian civilization. The Persian Empire encompassed Asia Minor in the north, to the Arabian Sea in the south, and from Egypt in the west to India in the east. Their subjects ranges from civilized Egyptians, Ionian Greeks and Indus River valleys. Persians governed with more religious and cultural tolerance. The Persians wore a distinct two-piece outfit, a fitted coat or jacket with trousers. The Persian trouser was cut full about the thighs and tapered to the ankles, so they could be tucked into boots. They were made of wool. The jackets, called candies, were voluminous flowing garments. The sleeves were fitted at the upper arm but gradually flared towards the wrist. There was another version of the trouser recorded which was a fitted style made of leather and sometimes vividly patterned. Advanced tailoring emerges with the need of such precisely fitted garments. High priests and royalty wore candies coloured in rare dye called murex purple made from ink glands of mollusks. Persians wore a greater variety of footwear. They wore ankle boots with long toes that curled up to a point. Other boots that reached mid-calf and around, uh, had round toes. Some shoes had straps, slippers and sandal styles were also used. Headgear was a brimless cylindrical hat called kula that flared wider at the top. Another hat style was a high domed brimless bowler. They were worn by nobility. 
A close-fitting cap with a pointed top called cask was worn by ordinary Persians. It sometimes included side and black back flaps to protect the wearer. Few pictorial representations of Persian women are available. Women were considered as subordinate in Persian culture and were kept secluded in households. The Persian style of the voluminous sleeved robe called a candice was adopted for a similar median design. This elaborate, richly decorated garment was reserved exclusively for the nobility and elite corps of warriors called the 10,000 Immortals. This module focuses on ancient Egyptian civilization, costume and culture. The main evidence of ancient Egyptian civilization is from Egyptian art, the contents of tombs and decorative motifs, sculpture, painting, etc. Uh, may not be accurate descriptions due to stylized art forms. Wall paintings inside tombs showed scenes from daily life, personal possessions and models of useful everyday objects. Decorative motifs derived from natural world or from religious symbolism. They appear in decoration of temples, tomb chambers or furniture and utilitarian objects and in clothing, jewelry and accessories. By 3200 BCE, the distinct cultures of Upper Kingdom and Lower Kingdom had amalgamated to form one kingdom. It was often depicted by the pharaoh's headgear of double crown. The pharaohs or the rulers of ancient Egypt were considered like gods. The priests were next in the social order, followed by nobility, military, scribes, craftsmen, peasants and labourers. The Egyptian agrarian-based economy revolved around the river Nile. During times when no farming could be done, the peasants would work off their taxes by working on building projects for the pharaohs, community or government. Scribes were middle-class Egyptians who learned from an early age the complicated pictorial writing called hieroglyphs and recorded virtually everything. The Egyptian people were very religious they believed in the afterlife and spent most of their lives and resources preparing for it. They had the bodies of the dead embalmed and preserved for the afterlife. Most of what we know about ancient Egyptians is evidence found in their tombs and grave sites. The average Egyptian only managed to send food, drink and clothes to the afterlife for their loved ones. For the upper classes and royalty, the tombs were built into massive stone pyramids or carved into rock cliffs. The interiors of these tombs were beautifully rendered in paintings depicting daily lives. Small figurines of servants were included to provide care. Personal belongings and wealth were also included to ensure a suitably comfortable afterlife. Medicine and medical treatments were also understood in depth and Egyptian doctors were very skilled. Family was at the center of Egyptian society. Even though it was a patriarchal system, Egyptian women enjoyed more freedoms and rights than any other civilization of that time. Women could run businesses, own land, testify in court and also serve as pharaohs. Egyptian life included a variety of leisure pursuits like board games, music and dancing, hunting and sporting activities. Egyptian sculptures and paintings reveal a standardized ideal of beauty that remained constant for more than 3000 years. Both men and women were represented as being very slender and tall. The ideal man had a triangular build with broad shoulders, trim waist and narrow hips. The ideal woman had a small waist and breast but full curvaceous hips and thighs. Egyptian civilization is classified into three eras. Old Kingdom Egyptians developed an accurate solar calendar much like the one we use today. The Middle Kingdom was known for achievements made in literature and for the increasing contacts that Egyptians made with surrounding cultures in the greater Middle East. 
Egyptians borrowed customs from other cultures and incorporated them into their lives. It conquered its neighbors to the south and expanded its control into other parts of Africa. Egypt became very rich during the New Kingdom and it displayed its wealth in lavish temples and more highly decorated clothes. Most Egyptians practiced daily grooming to varying degrees. The hot, humid climate made bathing regularly and personal hygiene an important concern for all but the very poor. Upper-class Egyptians shaved off all body hair and used a variety of moisturizing oils and sunscreen creams. Both men and women used cosmetics especially to enhance the eyes and protect from the glare of the sun. Eyeliner was made of powdered black coal and lead ore. Eye shadows were created by pulverized minerals like malachite, lapis lazuli or turquoise. Women tinted their nails with henna and daubed red ochre on their cheeks and lips. Fragrances like scented bath oils, aromatic lotions and perfumes were also applied as part of religious beliefs. Linen was used predominantly. Silk and cotton was also used. Wool was considered ritually unclean and was not worn by priests or by visitors to sanctuaries or for burial. It was, however, used as an outer garment. Linen dyeing through mordant was not achieved till the period of the New Kingdom. Therefore, most Egyptian clothing was made in natural, creamy white and bleached white color. Spinning and weaving techniques were well developed as early as the Old Kingdom. Fabrics with varying widths, decorative selvages, etc. were produced. Both men and women were part of the textile production process. Pleating of linen was done elaborately. Fabric embellishments like beadwork, embroidery and applique also existed. Most garments consisted of pieces of fabric, usually squares or rectangles, that were draped and tied around the body. Raw, unfinished edges of cut cloth were turned under and hemmed. Clothing forms for all ages and classes were relatively simple, with minimal sewing and construction required. The displayed table gives dis details of the garments worn by Egyptian men and women during various historical periods. Traditional Egyptian costumes for men were the loincloth and a wrapped skirt called shenti. Linen loincloths were under and outer garments shaped and worn like triangular diapers. Strings were attached for tying the garment around the waist. Sometimes a separate sash was also used. Leather loincloths were also worn over the linen ones as reinforcements. The shanty was a wrapped skirt, the length, width and fit of which varied with different time periods and social classes served as a major garment for men through all of Egyptian history. The shanty was often pleated and draped for ornamental effect. Long transparent skirts were sometimes worn over shorter opaque ones. Fits also varied from tight fitted to large triangular shapes with decorative paneling. Through cross-cultural contacts with the Near East, tunics appeared in Egypt. Tunics were made with or without sleeves and often made of sheer, almost transparent linen. Men appear in long, loose, flowing garments of sheer pleated linen. These are rectangular or square pieces of fabric that wrapped around the upper part of the body and did not extend below the waist. For upper body coverings, the skin of a leopard or lion fastened around the shoulders of men are seen in some early period paintings. In later periods, fabrics with animal skin simulations were painted and printed. These were believed to transfer the powers of the animal. A white necklace made from concentric circles of precious or semi-precious stones might be worn along over a linen gown, over a short cape or with corslet. The corslet was sleeveless. Men were depicted wearing narrow straps around the upper part of the body in varying styles. They were most probably a practical garment used to prevent perspiration from running down the body. 
Skirts were worn by lower class women at work. Slaves and dancing girls are also depicted occasionally in skirts. Wrapped dress or sheath and bead net dresses. Close fitting tube or fabric beginning above or below the breast and ending around the lower calf or ankle, sometimes with one or two straps holding it over the shoulders. Pleated and draped wrapped long dress. These are the most complex garments worn by Egyptian women. Tunics and v-neck dresses, shawls and cloaks of similar styles were worn. Sashes were used to hold clothing in place. In its earliest form, the Kala Siri was a very close-fitting tube dress, sewn at the side. It was held up by two straps that attached behind the neck. The straps came together at the front and the breasts were exposed. The typical Kala Siri was white. However, Women often dyed their color series in bright colors and especially during the New Kingdom covered them with detailed patterns. Wealthy women wore color series of fine, finely woven fabric, some so thin that the dresses became transparent. When the weather grew cold, they might throw a shawl over the top of their dress. Poorer women wore a color series made from heavier, coarser fabric and its cut was not as close. Color series typically extended down the leg to between mid-calf and ankle length. Men were usually clean-shaven, a beard was a symbol of maturity and authority and was worn by adult male rulers and young kings. During some periods, men shaved their heads as well. Women too sometimes shaved their heads. Wigs were worn over shaved heads or hair. Expensive wigs were made of real human hair while cheaper versions were made of wool, flax, palm fiber or felt. Most wigs were black in color, although blue, brown, white or some gilded examples exist. Women wore longer wigs than men. Their styling ranged from simple long flowing locks to complex braiding, curls or twists of hair. Egyptians developed artificial beards or beard wigs. Men of royal rank tied stubby beards on their chins for official or festive occasions. The king's beard was longer than that of other men and was usually worn straight and thick. Gods were depicted with thinner beards that curled up at the tip. Egyptians believed that kings were descended from the gods and in some ceremonies kings could wear a curved beard to show that they represented gods. The Egyptians had different kinds of headdresses. The Neem's headcloth was a stiff linen headdress that covered the head and most often had flaps that hung down the sides and over the shoulders. It was often full of bright colors. Another common headdress was the simple headband made of linen or perhaps even of leather inlaid with gold. The main purpose of this headdress was to hold the wearer's wig in place. Pharaohs are also depicted wearing a headdress known as the blue crown or caprish. This tall crown was likely made of stiff linen or leather and spread up and back from the forehead 6 to 8 inches. It was blue, covered in small circular studs and often had a carved ureus, a sacred hooded cobra ornament on the front and two long streamers hanging down the back. A famous crown was also worn by Queen Nefertiti, who ruled briefly around 1330 BCE. This blue cone-shaped hat tapered down and covered her skull. It was banded with a decorative stripe and had a menacing ureus at its front. The Shent, the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. When King Menes united the two Egypts, he combined the two crowns of Egypt into the Shent, or double crown. The shent had at its base the red crown which completely covered the wearer's hair. The white crown emerged out of the top of the red crown. The shent symbolized the power of the pharaohs who ruled over one of the greatest empires of the ancient world. The ruling pharaohs, kings and queens wore special ornaments of their own and these ornaments were filled with symbolism. Nearly every Egyptian pharaoh carried the crook and flail, symbols of the rule of the king. 
The crook was similar to a tool used by shepherds, a long staff with a hook at the end. The flail was a wooden rod with three straps hanging from one end, each strap bearing a decorative pendant. Another ornament carried or worn by many pharaohs was the ankh, a symbol of life that looked like a cross with a loop for its upper vertical arm, whose origins are a mystery to historians. Only high-status persons wore sandals, while low-status individuals went barefoot. Beads, leatherwork, applique and woven designs could all be used to construct the highly ornate decorative belts and aprons that were an integral part of Egyptian costume. These beads were strung on multiple strings of varying lengths that were then bound to a ring around the neck to make a wide, semicircular collar that covered the shoulders and chest of the wearer with bright colour. Collars were created with beads made of glass, precious stones, gold and a glazed pottery called faience. Collars were also sometimes made by attaching beads, stone and precious metals to a semicircle of fabric. Collars often had symbols of the gods carved into the large metal clasps or into the beads of the collar itself. The pectoral was usually a large, flat breastplate made of gold or copper, often decorated with symbols and inlaid with precious stones or glass. It was hung over the chest by a chain around the neck. Egyptians who could afford it wore brightly coloured jewellery to show their rank and importance in society as well as their love of beauty. Many items of jewellery served a spiritual purpose as well by carrying images of the gods that protected the wearer. Both men and women decorated their eyes, skin and lips. Red ochre pigment was used in a base of fat or gum. Resin was used to colour lips. Fingernails and toenails were polished and buffed. Henna a reddish hair dye may have been used to colour nails. Scented ointments were applied to the body. Eye paint had cosmetic, symbolic and medicinal functions. Eye paintings represented the eye of the god Horus, considered a powerful charm and the line formed around the eye helped to protect against the glare of the sun. In this picture, men and women wear sheer pleated linen gowns with wide bead collars. Man making the offering wears a leopard skin with a pleated linen shanty. All wear wigs. Those of men are shorter than those of women. A scented cone of wax is placed on their heads. The fingernails and toenails of both men and women are polished. Their eyes outlined in coal. The men wear sandals. This module focuses on the Indus Valley civilization, costume and culture. The Indus Valley Civilization was a Bronze Age civilization extending from what today is Northeast Afghanistan to Pakistan and Northwest India. The two great river basins of the Indian subcontinent, the Indus and the Ganges, were the earliest centers of urban development in South Asia. These cities were contemporary with those of Ur and Babylon in Mesopotamia and the Old Kingdom in cities of Egypt. The Indus had a writing system yet to be deciphered, highly developed visual arts and sophisticated technologies such as pottery and textile production. Indian historians assert that the spinning and weaving of cotton originated in the Indus Valley sometime during the late millennial BCE. During the same period, goat's wool called urn, meaning hairy covering of an animal was also spun and woven into textiles, especially for utilitarian items such as rugs, blankets, tote bags and camel saddle covers. The cities of the Indus Valley civilization were well organized and solidly built out of brick and stone. Their drainage systems, wells and water storage systems were the most sophisticated in the ancient world. They also developed systems of weights and trade. They made jewellery and game pieces and toys for their children. The quality of municipal town planning indicates that these communities were controlled by efficient governments. 
these clearly placed a high priority on accessibility to water. Modern scholars tend to see in this the influence of a religion which places an emphasis on ritual washing, much like modern Hinduism. Hygiene was also important to the inhabitants. The urban planning included the world's first known urban sanitation systems. Within the city, people obtained water from wells. Within their homes, some rooms had facilities in which wastewater was directed to covered drains. These lined the major streets. These ancient Indus sewage and drainage systems were far in advance of anything found in contemporary urban sites in the Middle East. The advanced architecture and construction techniques of the Indus cities are shown by their impressive dockyards, granaries, warehouses, brick platforms and protective walls. Their massive walls were probably designed to protect them as much from floods as from attack. Most city dwellers were traders or artisans. They lived with others of the same occupation in well-defined neighborhoods. Although some houses were larger than others, Indus civilization cities do not show the kind of massive gulf between wealthy and poor dwellings that is found in those of other civilizations. Their society seems to have been egalitarian to a remarkable degree. By 1800 BCE, the Indus Valley civilization saw the beginning of their decline. Writing started to disappear, standardized weights and measures used for trade and taxation purposes fell out of use. The connection with the Near East was interrupted and some cities were gradually abandoned. The reasons for this decline are not entirely clear, but it is believed that the drying up of the Saraswati River, a process which had become around 1900 BCE, was the main cause. Other experts speak of a great flood in the area. Either event would have had catastrophic effects on agricultural activity, making the economy no longer sustainable and breaking the civic order of the cities. Other animal motifs appearing on seals found primarily at the largest cities include dangerous wild animals like the rhinoceros, the water buffalo, the gharial, which is the crocodile, and the tiger. All of these animals would have been familiar to people living at the edge of the thick jungles and swampy grasslands of the Indus Plain, and they were revered as totemic animals, closely associated with important myths and legends. The majestic zebu bull with its heavy dewlap and wide curving horns is perhaps the most impressive motif found on the Indus seals. Generally carved on large seals with relatively short inscriptions, the zebu motif is found almost exclusively at the largest cities of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. This female figurine with four flowers arranged at the front part of a fan-shaped headdress with cups at two sides and braided edging. It is a heavily adorned with triple strand choker with pendant beads, a double strand necklace with central disc pendant and a triple strand belt with disc shaped ornaments. The majority of male figurines found are nude and adorned with rows of elaborate necklaces and bracelets while others depict silhouettes of men dressed in knee length skirts. One finely carved figurine of a bearded priest is shown wearing a lavishly decorated wrap robe over the left shoulder and tucked under the right arm, like the priest conakes of Mesopotamia. The all-over clover leaf pattern could indicate a woven motif, block print, embroidery or applique. An upper armband and fillet around the head are accented with circular ornaments. Women wore similar clothing with more accessories, especially decorative hip belts and bangles. They also wore elaborate hair arrangements. <laughs>